Welcome to Live Spirit Chat. This is your chance to participate in a group teaching session and get your questions answered about everything mystical, magical, witchy, spiritual. Talk about your spiritual development, developing your spiritual path, your spiritual connection, developing your psychic abilities, folk magic, working with your spirit guides, your guardian spirits, your ancestors, and everything related and in between. I'm Miss Melinda, owner and operator of Miss Melinda's Metaphysical Services. We do live spirit chats on Saturdays at 12 noon United States Central Standard Time. Thank you for being here, everybody. I am going to jump into the early bird questions, which are submitted via Instagram. So I'm going to be looking at my phone and answering those questions first, and then we'll be taking some live questions and moving into discussion. So let's see, starting with the first question. I was given the name of someone to consult in a dream and I can't remember that name. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, since this message already came to you via a dream, I would recommend continued dream work in order to tap further into that guidance. So um, in core shamanism, it's called dream incubation. Um, and it's really just about setting an intention before you go to sleep. So what I recommend is that you set up a little meditation practice or a little intention setting practice for yourself before going to sleep at night. And you can speak to your guides, but you can also speak to your subconscious minds and just set the intention that you're going to receive this name again, that you don't remember this information and that you want to be reminded of the name that was recommended to you. And it may not happen right away. You might have to be patient. Sometimes it takes three times. These things are often done in pairs of three. But I have a feeling for you it might come through sooner because you, you seem to have a strong connection to your dreams. So go ahead and give that a try. Have a little bit of patience with it and see if the guidance comes back up for you. If you feel that there was a specific guide or a specific spirit that connected with you to give you the name, then you may want to also set the intention that you want to reconnect with that specific guide or that specific spirit. The next question is, and as always, y'all, you can let me know if you have follow-up questions to anything that I'm answering or anything that we have discussed. Next question, any suggestions for going into surgery positive that I'll wake up? Yeah, so it's interesting that you asked this question because my husband and I were just discussing last night when I had surgery last year and um, how much work I had to do to, um, to set the intention that I was going to be receptive to the surgery and that I wasn't going to have any kind of subconscious blockages to the surgeon or to the invasion or um, to releasing control and allowing them to do their work. So I had to do some work surrounding the idea of releasing control, right? Releasing control of my body and letting them get inside my body and do the healing work that needs to be done. And what I recommend for you is that you do something similar, that you set some intentions and you know that your guides and your ancestors are with you when you're going into that surgery. And you know that the surgery is going to be healing for you. That even if it's uncomfortable to think about it, even if it's scary to consider that you're going to be knocked out, that people are going to be doing things to your body while you're not present, um, work on the idea of releasing control and of having faith in the healing process. Even though it's a medical procedure, it's a form of healing. So you do have to remind yourself that you want to be receptive to healing, that you do not want to be resistant to healing. So continue to work with that idea within yourself and work with the idea of releasing releasing um, control and submitting to the process of healing 
with the faith and intentions that you are protected by your guardian spirits or your ancestors or your, you know, whoever it may be, you're protected by the divine universe, you're protected by God, and you're going into this healing process because it is beneficial to you. It is good for you. It's going to offer you a better quality of life. It's going to offer you stronger health and vitality. Continue to focus on that positive outcome and the process that's going to unfold in your life because of those positive healing energies that they are going to be assisting you with. Next question is, do you believe in evil in the evil eye or psychic attacks and how can they be blocked? This is a rather complicated question. Be and I want to go into her next questions as well to give us a little bit of context because she is also saying, a shaman told me that it was all in what we invite or what we allow. I disagree with that. It can be to some extent what we believe, what we invite or what we allow, but not always. We don't have control over everything in the world. We don't have control over other people and we don't have control over everything in the world and we don't always have control over our circumstances. So just like um, some someone may be attacked walking down the street, even though they didn't invite that attack, even though that attack is not their fault, um, you may be psychically attacked, even though you didn't invite that attack, even though that attack is not your fault. And then she says, what she's noticed is if someone is jealous or powerful or angry, they can cause harm, right? And she appreciates my time and energy. So moving to part one of her question. I do believe in the evil eye and psychic attacks, but I distinguish them as very, very different things. So the evil eye is can, can be something very, very simple when somebody is jealous of you or envious of you or they don't like you, they don't want you to succeed, and they're kind of, they're, they're looking at you with that intent. They're looking at you, maybe not even literally, literally looking at you, but when they think of you, they have this energy or this intent behind, um, behind them, you know, behind their thoughts, behind their engagements, behind their actions, behind their gaze. So this can be as simple as um, the thoughts that people have about you affecting you, um, especially if there's somebody who is able to um, really project their energy or somebody who doesn't have control over how they project their energy or somebody who is really good at manifesting or really good at, at affecting the energy and the circumstances and events around them and maybe they don't even know it and they just don't have control over it. They're not taking responsibility for the energy that they put out, right? That's one way that the evil eye can happen. Another way that the evil eye can happen is when somebody actually is wishing you ill, wishing you harm. And with the evil eye, it's not so much about somebody actually, um, you know, performing magic or performing tricks about you or doing something actively against you. It's more about their intentions. It's all about their intentions and the energy behind their intentions. And a lot of this is just about the, the power of their thoughts and the power of the energy that they carry with them. So that's what the evil eye is. And I definitely believe in that, especially you know, how can we not, if we believe that we're all connected, if we believe that magic works, if we believe that we can energetically affect other people, affect events, affect circumstances, how can we then not believe that other energies and circumstances can affect us, right? But this is one of those situations where it's kind of a spiritual paradox because I also believe that if you believe in a loving universe and you believe that you are protected, then these things are not going to hurt you. So that's why I'm always talking about making sure that we do our cleansings, making sure that we set up our protection, making sure that we've got our mindset straight. You know, mindset is part of your protection. Um, also, who you allow around you, who you allow in your life, who you allow in your space, that's part of your protection. So keeping yourself protected 
is huge. Keeping yourself protected and keeping yourself strong, keeping yourself cleansed and asking for or setting up regular protection for yourself. These things are all going to go a long, long way in protecting you from normal everyday occurrences like jealousy and envy, which is behind the evil eye. Now, psychic attacks, that's a completely different thing. Psychic attacks are not um, in the same category as the evil eye. And I'll tell you that the reason I believe in psychic attacks is because it has happened to me. In fact, um, one of the ways, like one of the catalysts for my psychic development going to a new level when I was a young person was being around somebody who was extremely naturally psychically gifted and who was not always using their psychic abilities for good. So I have been psychically attacked and I experienced it firsthand and I experienced it in a very um, intense way, a very real, very powerful, very intense way. And it's something that took me many years to kind of wrap my head around, like how is it that some people are born with these really strong psychic abilities, um, just the natural ability to do things like enter your dreams, read your thoughts, enter your mind, um, try to influence your thoughts, things of this nature. Um, it took me a long, like I struggled with this for years. How is it that this person came into this world with this ability and that they chose to use it to manipulate and harm others, right? And this is when we were young, um, late teenagers, early, early adulthood. And there was a whole group of us who experienced this together. We experienced the influence of this person. And we all also experienced um, psychic awakenings of our own accord. Um, as I said, this was one of the periods where I went through a huge growth spurt in my psychic awakening in really developing and deepening those gifts and becoming aware of those gifts in a new way. There were many positive things that came out of this. I learned how to defend myself psychically. I learned that I had a natural ability to do that. Um, I also um, learned that being around other people with psychic abilities can create a domino effect where the whole group or everyone is really um, influenced to further and deeper growth. And I learned how you can grow together in a much more powerful, um, much quicker, stronger way when you're submerged in, in a community or a group of people who are also experiencing this phenomena or also going through this group. So um, that was a really interesting experience and one that I'm that's going to stick with me for the rest of my life. So long story short, I've been psychically attacked and I had to defend myself from this person for uh, years, actually, for years. And she wants to know if the psychic attacks can be blocked. And they can be blocked. It does take some learning um, and it does take you so there's different ways to approach this. So you could cut the energetic ties between the person between you and the person who is psychically attacking you. Um, but they, that might not prevent them from continuing to attack you. Um, you can set up pro protection, but protection doesn't last forever. No magic lasts forever. So that may not prevent them from continuing to attack you. So what you really have to learn is how to set up your own psychic boundaries. And the way that I work with that kind of psychic energy is basically with my chakras, with my chakra energy. And this is something that I learned during that phase. This is something I learned during that incredible time in our lives. And I... I did it naturally. I did it instinctively, intuitively. I just started um, closing my crown chakra and creating a barrier in my mind that couldn't be penetrated. And it took a lot of energy and I wasn't adept at it at the time. So it, um, it was a little bit draining because this person, it was a lot draining sometimes because this person was very 
very skilled and very powerful in their psychic abilities. So I would get bad headaches when I was around them. It took a lot of energy for me to block them from reading my thoughts, to block them from um, influencing me. Um, so it takes practice is what I'm saying. And I was working with my chakra at the time, chakras probably at the time, but I didn't even know it. I didn't know, um, you know, that the top of my head was a crown chakra. I didn't know how any of these, um, this flow of energy or any of these energy portals in my body really related to psychic abilities. I really didn't have any context or background information for any of this. It was all brand new for me all very strange. Um, so you, Querent, you who is asking this question, you have uh, some, you have an advantage because you do have some background information. You know what's going on. You have a, a foundation to work from. So it's going to be easier for you to set up these psychic boundaries. It can certainly be done. I can't tell you exactly how to do it in live spirit chat, but you can start by working with your mind and working with your crown chakra and learning to close up your mind, learning to seal it, <clears throat> learning to um, energetically and thoughtfully create a boundary around your mind which can't be penetrated. So just think of this as energy work. And I know that you're familiar with energy work. So think of this as a different kind of energy work and start experimenting with that. Start working with that. See what works best for you. See how you can continue to strengthen that ability. You can definitely learn to block a psychic attack. Also, make sure that you are not around this person. This person cannot be around you. You have to be create as much distance between this person as you possibly can. A shaman told you that it's all in what you invite or what you allow. And that's another one of those topics that can be a spiritual paradox, right? Because um, we, we can invite things by believing that the world is out to, to get us. We can invite things by believing that everyone wants to do magic against us or everyone is doing magic against us or constantly believing that we're cursed or, you know, believing that we're constantly vulnerable or we're constantly threatened. We can invite negative energy by being fearful like that, by being paranoid like that, by being, by setting up the perception of reality that the world is not a friendly place, that the universe is not a loving place, that things are constantly out to get us or to destroy us or want us to fail, right? We can influence our, our world and our lives and ourselves in that way, but also um, this can be a form of toxic positivity. Everything is not your fault everything doesn't happen because you invited it or because you asked for it or because you wanted it or because of your beliefs or your mindset. We just have to get over that idea. We're not God. We live in a universe where we don't control everything. We didn't create this world. We didn't create all these other people. You can get into some like deep psychological, spiritual, um, philosophical avenues here and say everything that you see and interact with is just a projection from your own mind or a projection from your own soul, right? You could go down that avenue, go down that rabbit hole and talk yourself in circles for the rest of your life if you want to. You know, that's something that can be debated. debated. But the fact is, if we believe in um, things outside of ourselves, then we know we don't have control over everything. And one of the biggest lessons of spiritual growth is when to let go of control, knowing when and how to release control and what we can have an influence over and what we cannot have an influence over. So we want to be really careful about this toxic positivity or toxic spirituality, which tells us that, you know, we're born into um, a impoverished family or we're born into abuse because that's our karma because we invited it or 
that we're in a, you know, someone has psychically attacked us because we invited that attack. That is equivalent to saying a woman was raped because she invited the attacker, because she had deserved it, because she wore the wrong thing, right? You can't tell someone you're psychically attacked because you invited that attack. So I think you can all see the difference there. Everything is not um, our own fault, right? We have to learn what we have control over, what we have influence over, and what we do not, what we need to surrender to the universe, what we need to release the urge to control. And that goes the other way too, like the shadow side of that is we have to learn what to blame ourselves for and what, what to take responsibility for and what not to blame ourselves for. You know, when we have the urge to control everything or when we believe that we have the ability to control everything, that also means that anything that goes wrong is our fault. It also means that anything that happens to us is our fault. So that's a very easy and dangerous way to get sucked into a spiral of things aren't going right because I'm not good enough. Things aren't going right because I didn't do things right. Like all, everything, you know, is my fault. Obviously, if something isn't going well in my life, it's because of me. So it's easy to really get off track when you have these control issues where you think that you can or should be able to control your entire reality. It's really important to have boundaries concerning what you can and what you should have an influence over and what you need to release and surrender to and accept. Okay, I think that that is all of the early bird questions so far. So now it's time to take your live questions. So those of you that are here with me live in our private chat place, because Live Spirit Chat has moved to a private location. And this offers you more intimacy. This offers you more one-on-one -on -one time with me. This offers you more anonymity. Um, this is a great way for us to protect our energy, protect our space and spend quality time together and really get in a good conversation. And if you want to get the information for private live spirit chat, you are invited. You are invited and when this video is saved on YouTube, I will create a link below the video. You can click on that to get the information for future live spirit chats and join us in our cozy private location. Those of you that are here today, it's time for you to submit your live questions. I'm happy to answer them to the best of my ability. We can talk about your spiritual development, developing your spiritual practice and your spiritual path. We can talk about your psychic developments, uh, magic, folk magic, candle magic, working with spirit guides, guardian spirits and ancestors. And we can talk about all kinds of things related and in between. So now is the time to go ahead and submit your live questions. I'll be happy to answer them to the best of my ability. What are some indications that a child is spiritually gifted? Well, there's going to be a wide range of indications depending upon what areas they're gifted in. But some of the things that children seem to have a natural propensity towards are um, spirit activity, like communicating with spirits, interacting with spirits. So if you find them talking a lot about entities that are not visible to you or visible to other people, a lot of times people blow that off as, oh, they have imaginary friends, when really children are talking to spirits or maybe even ancestors, things of this nature. If they talk a lot about um, their dream life, if they talk a lot about um, creatures or entities or other peoples that came to them in their dreams and they seem to be really profoundly moved by things that are happening in their dreams, if they seem to come out of their dreams with new information, messages, um, inspiration, you know. Um, 
listen to children. People don't listen to children. Like <laughs> that's listen carefully to children. Really, you know, when they want to talk to you about an, ex an experience they're having or when they have something to say, really get down on their level and look in their eyes and talk to them and allow them to talk to you and listen to them. So many times we're just blowing them off um, like, oh, they're just a kid. They're just talking nonsense or they're just talking about an imaginary friend or yeah, of course, these kids are interested in their dreams. They're, they're a child and dreams are crazy. But if you really start to listen to what they're saying, children very often have profound wisdom, profound knowledge and insights. And if we don't brush them off, we can learn about that. We can hear about that. And a lot of children are spiritually gifted. So it's not going to be unusual for you to notice that a child is spiritually gifted. What happens is that they learn to grow out of it or they learn to push it aside or they learn not to believe in it or they learn to ignore it or they have an experience that is um, scary. So they learn to put up really strong boundaries to block out their spiritual connection. Perhaps the people around them tell them that it's evil or the people around them tell them that it's wrong. They push that stuff back to the shadow side of their psyches and they try to repress it. So it's not going to be unusual to notice that a child is having some kind of um, spiritual connection, some kind of spiritual um, activity or spiritual gift. The other things that you can look out for are uh, psychic phenomena, right? So a child may tell you that they remember past lives. The, now I'm speaking from, from personal experience. I'll just be upfront that I'm remembering, I'm going to remember the things that um, I used to say to my mom that were clues about what, what was going on with me. So I would often talk to her about past life experiences. I told her that she and I lived together in a past life, that I used to be her mother and she used to be the child. Um, I told her about things that I had no way of knowing, um, things about her life that I had no way of knowing. I told her things, uh, I told her about memories that happened when I was a really, really small child, like a baby, like pre-verbal. I had really clear memories and really clear knowledge and information and insight about activities and event, events that happened when I was too small to even talk. And I remembered my thought process and my analysis and my insights about situations that happened when I was that small, like when I was a tiny baby. So really, really early memories like that, nonverbal memories before children were nonverbal. Um, having really in-depth insight and evaluations and analysis of situations that happened when they were very small. Um, and having the really having like insights and knowledge about circumstances and situations when they're still small children, seeming to have knowledge that's beyond their years or wisdom or insights that are way beyond their years, right? That's a sign that this is an old soul. This is a child who has be, been reincarnated and is carrying with them um, information, skills, talents, wisdoms from a past life. So th that's a big one to look out for. And then I definitely had a lot of interaction with spirit activity, um, a lot of interaction with dream life. I saw a lot of entities. I had a lot of phenomena at, at night, like nighttime occurrences of visiting entities. Um, and these are some of the things that I would talk to, to my mom about. And at times she was um, shocked and surprised. And at other times I think she was like, oh, you're just playing with your dolls in the middle of the night. So these are some of the things that um, you can look out for. Yeah, I hope that helps. Let me know if you have any additional questions or any follow-up questions for that. And for the rest of you that are here, this is a great time to submit your live questions. I'm just going to look at my planner really quickly. My old school 
pencil written planner and see if I have any special announcements to make for upcoming events. As I was saying before we started recording today's live spirit chat, I had the pleasure of offering a class on shadow work and underworld journey through your heart to your shadow self. I offered that class in conjunction with Minx Plus Muse here in Austin, Texas. It was a live virtual event and it was incredibly incredibly fulfilling. It was incredibly uh, meaningful for me. And I had a great connection with the ladies who attended. Really, really grateful for Minx Plus Muse for giving me that opportunity. Um, it was a lovely class. And I'm going to be recording a similar class, a class based on these shadow work principles and based on my own studies and my own insights into shadow work. I'm going to be recording a version of this class which is going to be available to my patrons, to my mystic members via Patreon. And this is a class that's going to be available for them this month in July 2020. And I'm also going to have that class available for sale um, digitally on my website. So working on a really in-depth way of working with our shadow material, in-depth but approachable, understandable, down to earth, working with our shadow material, working on continuing to heal ourselves, taking responsibility, taking agency for our own healing. We're in a changing world. We're in the middle of a huge transformation. We're washing out the old. We have this empty space where we're calling in the new. In order for us to be active co-creators in creating this new world, creating this new reality for ourselves. And in order for us to ensure that this is going to be lasting change, we need to be active participants. And in order to be active co-creating participants, we need to make sure that we work on our own healing, that we take this down to the individual level. If we want this change to stick and take place on the collective level, then we need to make sure we also work on ourselves on the individual level and shadow work is an excellent way to do this, an excellent way to usher and guide yourself through your underworld and into your own healing journey in a very um, direct way, in a very in-depth way, and in an incredibly meaningful, transformative way, a rebirth through the underworld. So you all can look for that in the near future. I've been really unsettled since last night. I'm still feeling anxious and I'm not sure why. Should I be grounding? Any suggestions? This is not a usual state for me. I feel like something is wrong and now I'm finding out my surgery is rescheduled. It's cosmetic. Even my boyfriend was unable to make me feel better last, now, last night. How can I identify what's wrong or ground? Okay. You can use some of these shadow work techniques that I was just talking about in order to find out what's wrong. But first of all, I wanna say, it's a good sign that the surgery was rescheduled. You may be picking up on that something was like not quite right with the, with the um, energy surrounding that date, right? You may be having some precognition that something was not quite right with the schedule date for your surgery. What I'm picking up on psychically is that it's a positive thing that your surgery is being rescheduled because you were intuitively or psychically picking up on the fact that something was amiss. Like that date was not the right date for you. Things are going to go better now. Things are going to go in your favor now that the surgery has been rescheduled. So keep that in mind. That's a positive change and one that needed to happen. Now you've got two other um, questions kind of embedded within this. We're going to get into how you can identify what's wrong and I'm going to give you some really basic techniques for shadow work in order to do that. Okay. 
So if you would like to do some grounding work, it's really simple. It's really easy. Um, there's a couple of different techniques for it. And in fact, why don't you check my Instagram, my IGTV, I've got an excellent grounding meditation there. Also, for those of you here on YouTube, when this is saved on YouTube, I've got an excellent grounding meditation. It's saved in both places. It's on YouTube and it's on Instagram Live. So check that grounding meditation. That's a, a great way. It's, it's simple, it's effective, it's powerful. Go ahead and do that grounding meditation and then if you want something that's even a little bit more simple, more approachable, easy to just kind of do quickly in the moment, get barefoot. And if you can go outside and stand in, in the um, dirt or in the grass, if you're not averse, um, you can go outside and do this. If not, you can do it inside as well. But it, you know, it might be more powerful if you do it outside, depending on how you feel about nature. But just, Stand hip width apart and really push your feet into the ground and center yourself. Take a moment to take some deep breaths. Take a moment to really um, clear your mind and center yourself and um, tune into your feet and how they feel touching the ground, how, how they feel connecting with the earth. And imagine yourself growing roots down through the soil, down into the ground. Imagine them going as far down as you would like. Imagine them going down into the center of the earth if you would like. And imagine yourself like a tree that has deep roots, right? And even that alone is enough. But then if you wanna take it to um, and the next level, then you can imagine that, and not just imagine, you can do this energy work, right? So send everything unwanted and unneeded, everything that is adversely affecting you right now, all your stress and tension, all your anxiety down through those roots to be absorbed by the earth and transmuted, transformed. And then as you breathe in, then you can draw up powerful, new, cleansing, revitalizing, energized energy, vibrant energy to renew you, replenish you, revitalize you. So as you exhale, you're releasing what needs to be released through your roots. And as you inhale, you're pulling into yourself, revitalizing, cleansing, vibrant energy to renew you and replenish you and assist you with moving about your day, moving about your life. So there's that grounding meditation in addition to the grounding meditation that I've already have on YouTube and on Instagram. Now let's get to, you know what? I wanna say one more thing about grounding activities because recently I have been getting into belly dancing a little bit and I've been doing a belly dancing course, the witchcraft of belly dance with April Shaley and you can find her um, through uh, April's Arcana. Okay, April Shaley, April's Arcana. I'm doing a virtual belly dancing class with her, the witchcraft of belly dance and it's amazing. And she taught us a grounding ex exercise that you can do through dance and it's really just calling in earth energy. And the important part that you're going to want to remember, uh, because you can do this with intuitive movement. You don't need to be belly dancing when you do this. You can do this with any kind of dance or any kind of intuitive movement, or you can even do it alone. But the important thing is to have your feet a little bit wider than hip width, and as you're dancing, as you're moving around, tap your, your heels into the ground and just tap them. And if you have a beat going, like if you have some drumming going, like I would recommend maybe some shamanic drumming for this, um, something of that nature. So you can tap to that beat, kind of alternate your feet and just tap into the ground and just really um, get into the feeling and the idea and the energy of calling up that earth energy and tuning into that earth energy and allowing that earth energy to move through your body. This is a, a way to connect through movement with the element earth. And it really can be a moving meditation as well. 
which is really powerful. Like a lot of times people are afraid that in order to meditate, they have to sit alone um, in an empty room and that they're not allowed to think, that they have to clear their mind of thoughts, that they have to be a blank slate and that they have to do nothing. This is not the case. There are hundreds of ways to meditate and there are many, many ways to do powerful moving meditations. This is one of them. This dance can be a moving meditation for you. And I recommend that you just move the rest of your body however it feels natural to you, however it feels intuitive to you. Just keeping in your mind the whole time that you're connecting with earth energy, you're connecting with the element earth, and you're calling up the element of earth into your body, you're embodying the energy of the earth, right? So this, this is a great way to ground and also to empower you at the same time, and also to move some energy around in our bodies. Like, a lot of times when we're feeling anxious and agitated, when we're, what we're really dealing with is energy that wants to be expressed, energy that wants to get out, energy that is looking for a way out of our bodies. And if we don't provide it a way out of our bodies, then it does have the potential to stagnate and become problematic for us. You know, that can um, result in health issues. It can result in exhaustion or depression. It can result in all kinds of other things. So when we're feeling anxiety, when we're feeling like agitation or a difficulty to remain still, um, this kind of thing, it's a signal our body is sending us that there's energy that wants to get out. It needs to be expressed. So movement is a great way for you to alchemize this anxiety, to transform this energy of anxiety into something that's going to be medicinal for you, that's going to be healing for you, that's going to be helpful for you. Now, you haven't done your morning walk. That may be your problem right there. <laughs> so often we, um, so often, you know, this is the case for us, for all of us, you know. If I don't do my meditations regularly, if I don't do the things to take care of myself regularly, you know, I can definitely feel a difference. We were talking about that today before we started recording live spirit chat as well. I've been taking a lot of extra time to do things like work in my garden, work with my plants, work with my house plants. That's really the only way that I have to connect to earth energy and to offer myself some additional grounding outside of, of being in my, um, meditation space or being in front of my altar and actively doing the energy work myself um, because I can't really go out in nature right now. The nature is too crowded around us. Um, there's too much going on where I live. Uh, you know, I'm staying home, of course. So I've been taking a lot of extra time to do that, that work to connect with earth energy to keep myself grounded. You don't want to be, I can't just be cooped up in one room doing this work all the time. You know, there comes a time when that's too much as well. I can't, you know, you, I don't want spiritual burnout either. I can't be constantly trapped in a room doing meditations or doing spiritual work or sitting in front of an altar. You need balance in all areas of your life. So it sounds to me like your morning walk is a great way for you to take a baby step towards ushering some of that balance and connecting a little bit further with the earth energy. Now let's get down to some methods and techniques for determining um, what is like really going on. What's wrong? Um, why are you really feeling so anxious about this? So this is going to sound really simple. And like many things that sound really simple, it's also really, really powerful. What I recommend is that you do a journal exercise and that you ask, start with the question, why? Ask yourself, why am I feeling so anxious about this surgery? You have to go into this with an open mind. You have to go into this with some flexibility and some willingness to be adaptable and also some willingness to 
examine things that you didn't necessarily prepare to examine. So what we're talking about here is a small technique to begin shadow work, right? And what we're doing with shadow work is we're uncovering the parts of ourselves that are hidden to ourselves. The mechanisms that we have set up in order to hide things for ourselves, something like anxiety can be a symptom of the shadow material that we are repressing. So it's the symptoms that are our teachers. It's the symptoms that lead us into where we can begin the work. It's the symptom, the anxiety, that allows us a gateway or a doorway to dig deeper into this work, to begin the work, to enter the shadow. So you can view your anxiety in this situation as a teacher, as an entryway, as something that you're grateful for, as something that is showing you the way, something that is directing you deeper within yourself and letting you know that something is wrong or that there's something deeper to look at here. There's something deeper to examine. You can send some gratitude to your anxiety because it's really doing its job. It's telling you that there's something you can learn from, something you can deep, more deeply examine. So sit down with your journal. And you know, if writing isn't something that resonates with you, that's okay. You could do this with a tape recorder. You could do this with voice recordings. I say a tape recorder with your phone. Do this with the voice recordings. Um, you could do this by speaking out loud, but it's more beneficial to have a record of it. So that's why I'm recommending either writing or perhaps recording it. I will say there's something really interesting that happens when we write, when we set up that um, coordination between our brain and our hands, we allow ourselves to enter into a deeper kind of um, intuitive knowing that we have in our physical bodies and we allow the opportunity for our conscious minds to relax a little and usher ourselves more deeply into another kind of knowing. So that's the benefit of writing. That's why journaling can be so helpful, so useful. But you start with the question, why? Why am I feeling so anxious? And you have to be prepared to be totally open to and totally honest about the answer that arises within you. And if the answer doesn't arise right away, that's okay. Just give yourself some space for that answer to bubble up, be receptive, be a witness to what bubbles up and really accept it and be honest about it. And then whatever answer comes up, you have to ask yourself why again. So let's try to think of some examples. So somebody might say, why am I, why did I get into a relationship with somebody who is emotionally unavailable? And the first question that might come up is, or the first answer that could come up, something very common that could come up is because my family is emotionally unavailable and because that's how I was raised or because that's the pattern that I have always known. And then you ask yourself, well, why? Why did I follow the pattern that my family followed? Why did I seek emotionally unavailable people just because that's what I saw in my family? Why did I continue this pattern? And as you keep asking yourself why, you will get to something deeper that you haven't recognized before, that you haven't considered before, that you haven't thought of before. And it might be something like, I got into a relationship with an emotionally unavailable person because I don't want to be available myself, because I don't want to show myself to somebody else, because I want to keep myself protected. Right. So this is the kind of thing that you're looking for. So you can ask yourself, why am I feeling anxious? And the answer that comes up might be because I'm afraid of dying. And then the next question that you'll ask yourself is, why am I afraid of dying? And then the next thing that could come up is some kind of belief or mindset or perception that you have about death that needs to be explored further. Maybe there's something about your views of death that are no longer serving you anymore or be have become a destructive force in your psyche, a destructive force in your worldview. Maybe there's something about 
your fear of death that is really feeding into larger issues and really affecting the way that you are making decisions and the way that you're interacting in your relationships and the way that you're behaving in your life. So what we're looking for in shadow work is repressed material in our psyche that is having a negative or destructive effect on the way we live our lives or on the decisions we make, on our relationships, on the choices we make, and on how much fulfillment we allow ourselves to have and how much meaning we allow ourselves to attain and how much we allow ourselves to gain out of life, right? Shadow material is repressed material that becomes something destructive for us, that becomes something that acts in opposition to our, real, our soul self, our higher self, and the things that we really truly need and desire in order to be fulfilled, in order to have meaning, and in order to be fully alive and fully feeling in life. So that's what we're looking for with shadow work. And it's usually not, like I think people have a mis conception about it that they're trying to uncover something that has happened to them or something somebody else said or something somebody else did that somehow caused them to be how they are. And yeah, that can be really valuable if you're uncovering things that you don't remember and it has played a significant role in your life story. But the core of shadow work, what we're really looking for at the deepest level, are those mechanisms that we have set up for ourselves. The, the things that we have created in order to keep ourselves safe or in order to make ourselves adaptable or in order to fit ourselves into a mold or in order to be more presentable to the world. So it's really about the things that we can uncover, that we have some agency over, that we can take some responsibility for, that we can have some control over in terms of how we approach the world, how we approach our lives, how we approach love and relationships and fulfillment and work and you know all of these things. So how we approach our um, personal psychological and emotional and spiritual nourishment, how much we allow ourselves to be nourished and um, inspired and um, cared for and engaged. So I hope that helps. You can start with the question, why am I anxious? Be open to where that takes you and then take it deeper and deeper. Go, go as deeply as you can. And people will say, how do I know when I've reached the truth? How do I know when I've unveiled what needs to be unveiled? You'll know because it will feel like for me, it feels like a relief. It'll feel like, oh, like a weight is taken off of you. Like you can take a deep breath and be like, that, that's it, that's what it is. You'll also know because it will be something you haven't thought of before. It'll be something that isn't totally obvious, that you haven't considered, that hasn't been fed to you by someone else or by the outside world, that isn't necessarily cliche or isn't necessarily what you would expect it to be. And you'll have an intuitive knowing. You'll just know that that's what it is. It'll be like looking yourself in the mirror. You know, it'll be like staring yourself down. You'll be like, oh, that's what it is, you know? And um, a lot of times people are hesitant. You may have some trepidation about doing shadow work and that's totally fine. That's totally normal. But what I will say is that people will talk to you about it as if it's going to result in you being a hysterical, snotty, crying, blubbering mess. And that's not necessarily the case. I've had the experience where it just feels refreshing. Like I just feel revitalized, like a weight is taken off my shoulders. Um, even though it's like something about myself that I'm like, wow, that you know, that's, that, that's intense, that needs to be addressed, right? But I think that's also has to do with like, what work you may or may not have done previously regarding how well you accept your own flaws and how well you accept your own humanness. So it's also helpful to go into this with the attitude that you're only human, you have flaws, you make mistakes, you know you're going to uncover something that you want to change that needs to be um, healed, right? Like this is all a part of it. And 
having the awareness is the first step to the growth and the point is for growth and healing. So when you keep those things in mind, then it's much easier to look at something about yourself and be like, I'm, I'm glad that I know this. I'm happy and grateful that I know this because it's going to help to release me from illusions, you know, from not seeing my reality and myself and my life and others clearly, um, rather than looking at it and being like, I'm devastated. My life is a mess because I'm imperfect, because I'm human. Just know already that you're imperfect and you're human and that it's okay. And that however you feel or whatever you think or whatever mechanisms you've set up for yourself are also normal, right? Go into it with those attitudes and you will be feeling a lot better. It'll be a lot easier to handle and to face. I can't tell if it looks like I have maybe a private message, but I can't tell. Oh, and I see that one of the questions you asked me was private, so I apologize that I read it out loud, but I don't think I said anyone's name, so that's good. And with that, we are going to go ahead and bring today's live spirit chat to a close. Thank you all for being here. It has been a pleasure. As I said, I think I've got new faces. So welcome, welcome. Very nice to see you. Don't be shy. Please come back. Please ask your questions. Thank you all for your excellent questions. Thank you for your engaging conversation. I really appreciate all of you. I wish you many, many blessings. Please be well. Until next time.